Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I have the second interview from my visit this week to DJI headquarters in New York City. I was lucky enough to get some time with Brendan Shulman, who's the Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs for DJI, to discuss the upcoming FAA Remote ID proposal. Now, Brendan's the perfect person to have this conversation with because he's been involved in the process from the very beginning. And you can imagine DJI, as one of the largest manufacturers of drones, is really focused on this issue because the impact of what this proposal could mean for the hobby could be devastating, not only for us flyers, but for the manufacturers that have to comply with whatever proposal is turned out. So this was a totally unscripted conversation. I asked them a lot of hard questions that I've had about where the proposal came from, how they ended up with the conclusions they did, and what it really means for the hobby. And he was very open and honest about all the answers and given us really good background on what DJI is doing to try to stay ahead of this and how DJI spent a ton of time and treasure getting involved with the different committees and proposals that are out there to try to craft something that ends up in a common sense space for us. And I know a lot of people out there are very upset about this NPRM. And by the way, I have a copy of it down below at a link. So if you go below, you'll find a link for the actual NPRM, which is FAA-2019-1100. Also down below is a link where you can go to the FAA website and let them know your opinions because there's about four days left before that comment period closes. And it's really important that if you're upset by anything you heard today in this interview, that you go over to that FAA website and let them know what you're upset about. And believe me, there's plenty to worry about in this FAA proposal. So I'll run the interview now, but what I like about this company so much, and I've said it before, is nobody's ducking me. When I contact them to ask them the hard questions, they're more than happy to meet with me and have these conversations. And there's really no boundaries. There was no scripting involved with this. It was just me sitting down and firing questions at Brendan, which I think he answered very, very well. So stay tuned for the interview. And if you've got any questions at all, drop those in the comments below, I'll get back to you. But please, again, remember, I had nothing to do with the proposal. DJI had nothing to do with the proposal. So don't shoot the messenger, just enjoy the interview. Let's all get smarter together. And please, if you haven't commented on the FAA website yet, go over there now and make your comments known because there's 25,000 plus comments up already. Somebody at the FAA has to look at that and think, yeah, there's some opposition to what we're putting out there. So add your name to that list for sure. So thanks very much for watching today and I hope you enjoy the interview. Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. Today I'm at the DJI headquarters in New York City with Brendan Schulman, Vice President of Policy and Legal Affairs for DJI. We're going to talk through some of the questions you guys have asked around the NPRM from the FAA, which is the FAA 2019-1100. Um, so I want to get some of the basic stuff out of the way first. Where did this come from? How did the FAA decide it was time for remote ID and what's, what's really the basis for the legislation? I think you'd have to go back to 2016. There, there's federal legislation from Congress directing the FAA to, to begin exploring consensus standards and to collaborate with industry stakeholders on what was called remote identification, namely the ability to identify who's flying a drone remotely, basically on the ground when the drone is flying in the air. And that really set off um, the FAA's effort to figure out how to do that, uh, which I think came to a, to a head in, in many ways in mid-2017 with the Remote ID Aviation Rulemaking Committee that I was a member of. Right. That ran for the summer. We produced a report to the FAA detailing how to do remote ID and some of the policy considerations. Uh, it then took over two years for the FAA to put out its proposal for how to do it. And that's, that's the situation we're in right now, mm -hmm. is that we're in this comment period on the proposal. Okay, good. So I'm uh, completely comfortable with that. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about the ARC in a little bit. But so the intent of it is really just to identify a pilot. And I understand that if a drone is approaching a sensitive military location or a nuclear power plant, it'd be really good for the security people to know who's flying the drone and, and even where they're standing in case they're kind of a bad actor. So that makes perfect sense. What's interesting to me about the proposal is that I've read uh, the 319 pages multiple times, <laughs> which was, was not easy. <laughs> and, and it's so complicated because it refers to other parts of the document and other documents. I've also spent a lot of time with the ARC's recommendations. And I think it's important we talk about that because that was a group of 74 stakeholders from all different constituencies, law enforcement, manufacturers, uh, other government agencies. And I can't imagine being in that meeting and trying to get any consensus with, with all these different interests in that group. But you guys somehow hammered it out as part of smaller groups, I guess, to come back with a proposal that I read through and felt was very common sense. It made perfect sense to me. We can talk a little bit about the details of it, but that was a lot of work on your part. 
And you guys must have felt really good that you found some level of consensus that you could put forward to the FAA to say, we've done your homework, we've got all these constituents that have built, you know, built into this project. Um, why did the FAA, do you have any insight into why they didn't use that and, and moved right to the edge of the worst case scenario? Well, I, I, so first of all, I think the, the ARC, there were, were 74 members, but as we observed at the time, um, many of those members, most of those members were, were, were organizations that were interested in remote ID because it either was a business opportunity for them, they right. were selling a solution or some part of a solution, or they were law enforcement, airports, people who, who were beneficiaries of remote ID for some other purpose. Right. And there were very few stakeholders on the ARC that were drone manufacturers or drone operators or service providers mm -hmm. or recreational users. Okay. Uh, so in the first instance, the ARC actually was not well balanced in terms of recommending a balanced outcome. It was very focused on finding potential solutions and recommending those to the FAA mm -hmm. without really considering all of the interests involved. Uh, and yet, I agree with you, the, the, the outcome was still quite reasonable. There were good, thoughtful discussions. It did take most of the summer. It right. was really lengthy uh, meetings uh, multiple times per week for about three months. Uh, and, and a length, I think it was like an 80 page report. Right. Um, so. Well, thanks for that, by the way. That's you, another 80 pages I had to pour over to read through. But, <laughs> well, you've had two years. It to was read very it. detailed. Like, I appreciate <laughs> okay. it. Yeah. So, um, and I think the, there are many recommendations in there, but really the, the fundamental one is that you know, how do you do remote ID? Right. And, and the answer was there was no consensus on one way to do it. We looked at, I think, eight different ways, including the one I like the best was use the LEDs on the drone to blink, like, sure. like a Morse code type pattern. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then just use an optical sensor. The, the problem with that is it, it wouldn't work at a sufficient distance. Right. Uh, so we looked at basically radio type solutions, broadcast radio, mm -hmm. as well as network connected solutions. A and there was no consensus on picking one. Rather, the, the ARC said, look, there's a lot of uh, cost and, and ease of compliance benefits in, in broadcast, but right. as an alternative, you could also instead do network. So effectively, it was an either or gotcha. outcome. Do one or the other, they both work, mm -hmm. uh, they both can serve the remote ID function. Now, your question is, why wasn't that yeah. the outcome in the, in the proposal? I don't know. Um, the, the FAA says in, in the NPRM that, that doing both, requiring you to do both, is results in a more complete solution. Yeah. That's about all they say. They, right. they also point to the sort of future of EV loss operations and UTM as one reason to, to do that as well. Right. But I, you know, part of our comment is going to be there's insufficient explanation to burden people with doing something two different ways. Right. And, and when clearly the ARC said something else, uh, notwithstanding all the interests in their, right. in their own solutions, uh, and we know they both work. Okay, so I, I read through the ARC proposal, and I probably, I'm going to do a separate clip on it, but it's important we kind of go through it briefly. So in that proposal, from what I read, if you were flying, and there's a bunch of different types of drones out there, so a lot of the drones are basically Wi-Fi, they go three or 400 feet, they're hobbyist drones or small toy drones, you had tiered solutions for that category of drone having no remote ID whatsoever, because again, I'm flying at 400 feet, you can see where I'm standing, right? So it's not a threat, they're lightweight, they're not really big. The second was anybody that's operating today within visual line of sight. So basically all the hobbyists today that don't have part 107s, or even if they do, if they're flying within visual line of sight, they're not flying in controlled airspace, they're not getting special exemptions or waivers, they would do a broadcast of the remote ID, which I think is perfect because it lets people on the ground identify that digital license plate in the air and take action if needed, but at least it lets them know who they are. And then you recommend it broadcast and transmit for operations that were maybe future operations beyond visual line of sight, or if I'm in New York City surveying buildings or something around people, or I've got a waiver, that made sense to me because then I can broadcast it and transmit it and it's kept for a while if I have to review it. Um, those, those tiered approach just made so much sense. I can't believe the FAA completely discarded them out of hand. It just seems, it seems like somebody else had their thumb on the scale saying that's not enough. We got to go further. Uh, yes. And I think the, um, the, the discussion there in the NPRM is basically as the FAA, we don't want to figure out what those tiers are, what right. their approach is, we're just going to sort of go to the the um, most complex right. form of operations and then require all drones, right. other than a few exceptions, all drones to do all of the above. Okay. And, and so to some extent, you, you could say that's just a, a, a choice by the FAA not to uh, engage in the in the thought process right. and the de determinations as to which types of operations or which locations 
would require one or the other or both. Right. But rather to say, well, because some operations would require both, maybe in the future, mm -hmm. we're just going to require both today across okay. the board because it's easier for us as an agency. Okay. So the challenge for me with that, and again, the recommendation I've made on the channel, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, but get to the FAA site, post your comments if you haven't done it. You have six days left. It's really important that they hear from you. And for those of you out there that say, it doesn't matter, they're not going to listen, they read those comments and they're obligated to not respond to them, but at least take them into consideration. So if the large body of comments are that this process is overly burdensome, they're going to listen to that, maybe they'll back off. The second suggestion I'd make, and I'll have a second clip coming on this, is the ARC presentation, the recommendations you put together in that final report, is that tiered system I just talked about, I think is logical, easy to implement, and it's not overly burdensome for the average flyer that's out there. Unless you're doing very complex missions in big cities where you've got waivers, then you've got to broadcast and transmit. But I think in general, 90% of the people that are flying can get by with you know, operations maybe broadcasting in certain circumstances. So those two things are super important. Going beyond that, though, a lot of the confusion in the marketplace is somehow, and I, I don't know why this is the case, you're getting beat up a lot for the NPRM as if you guys architected it, like there's some big cabal where you're working with commercial operators behind the scenes and the hell with the hobbyists and we're, you know, that's not the case. I mean, I, I, I come out in favor of you guys so much because you've taken the extra step to build in no-fly zones, to protect us from inadvertently flying into areas we shouldn't be. You've built in now this drone phone application to show how easy it would be to simply identify a drone operator. Now, I, it's unfair that you get that much grief from the public because they're like, I'll never buy this product because of that. You're protecting the public by doing that stuff. So it is ironic that there's that pushback for you. But going forward, you guys are obligated as a manufacturer to follow whatever the FAA comes out with the final proposal. So I, I've been at DJI almost five years. And mm -hmm. before that, I, I think it was fairly well known as an advocate for various uh, users who are having issues with FAA and more generally. And I like. Everything I've done for five years has been to advocate for the freedom from unreasonable regulations right. of the people using the technology. And that's been a consistent mission of mine at DJI for all these years. And so everything we do from geofencing to remote ID, we're doing that because we need to lead. We need to right. kind of show how to get things done and solve problems. We can't deny that drones at airports are a risk. We sure. can't deny that there are security issues. Yeah, or over wildfires in California. I mean, there's a lot of places that don't belong. Right? Yes. So, you know, you, you can you can debate whether the Gatwick incident was a drone or not, and that's right. just one example. But yeah. certainly the, the problem of drones at airports is real. Sure. And we can't just deny that. And so what we need, whether we're an industry company or just myself personally, is we, we need to lead with solutions that make sense so that ultimately the regulation that comes out is as reasonable as possible. Right. And in the case of, of geofencing or remote ID, like th these are ways of, of trying to mitigate the risk in place of more burdensome regulations. So exactly. imagine if we had a Gatwick every day because there were no geofencing. Right. Right. Would you then no, I complain agree. about DJI geofencing? No, you wouldn't. Probably. You wouldn't. Okay. So so that that is the scenario that we think we've avoided. Yep. Uh, even though it gets in the way of a small number of, of operations. But there are ways around that. You can get There's temporary authorizations. Yeah. I mean, we've all done that. We've That's all right. hit the Atlantic system yeah. and gotten authorizations when we need it. So look, it's it's just, it's not surprising that as, as the largest manufacturer, we, we get a lot of attention and, and complaints just because of who we are and, right. and sort of accept that as part of the price of doing what's right. Right. And, and, that, and, that, and that's where we come to the whole drone to phone demo. Like sure. that, that was a demonstration, and just like Aeroscope was a demonstration of how to do remote ID in a way that is the least burdensome and least costly for everyone flying a drone, mm -hmm. right? Make it simple, make it built in, no fees, you turn it on, it's there. Right. It works locally, so it's protective of privacy in the yep. sense that you're not transmitting to a database somewhere. It's just like a license plate, it's locally available. To us, that's the way to get it done, and that was the point of doing Aeroscope, and that was also the point of showing the drone to phone remote ID solution in Montreal uh, not that we're releasing that app, but right. this was a proof of concept demo in the real world mm -hmm. that works, showing that broadcast works. Right. And, and, and we did it with existing technology. We, we updated the, uh, the software on the drones that we used in the demo, and then we created a, a, a free uh, app on the, on the smartphone side. Right. So there you go. There's your remote solution. I, it, it, didn't, it didn't cost any money to the drone user. Right. That's the point. No, I, I'm so, with you on that. Yeah. And I think the funny part about it is that I know, because we talk, I know that you spend time, your own time, and DJI's time and treasure getting out ahead of these issues. The fact that you're on the art committee means you gave up a lot of time over the summer 
you know, when we're all flying drones to be in those committee meetings, yes. and I'm sure that can't be pleasant to be there with a bunch of people arguing about stuff. I'd rather be flying too. I'm sure, yeah, we'd <laughs> take it easy. And, and the point I'm trying to make is that I work with all the manufacturers. Everybody else has got their heads down about this. They're kind of holding back. They're not saying anything. You guys are out in front of it. But if this proposal goes through the way it's written, you can't buy another drone and get away with it. Like, everybody's got to adhere to whatever the regulations are. So it's not like, oh, I'm never going to buy that. I'll buy this. Well, this has to do the same thing. In 2016, you, right. could, you could see that remote ID was coming. I agree. And you could certainly see it by mid-2017. I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm with you on that. And, and, and that's right. It's, it's safe. Important. It's a license plate. That's all it is. I'm it's social, but it's also social acceptance, right? right. We, we need the population, the public, to know that there's a way to hold drone users accountable when they do do something wrong in the, in the rare instances. Otherwise, right. the fear is what governs everything. And so this also applies to the local concerns, like, like privacy. Like we, we keep saying, and I've said this many times, that there are existing privacy statutes that govern drones spying in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if the drone comes along, actually spies in the backyard, and right. flies away, mm -hmm. how is the homeowner supposed to no hold idea. that person accountable? Right. So we need remote ID as an accountability mechanism. Yep. That's undeniable, and it's inevitable. The, the question is, for the entire industry, how are we going to do it? And what is the most reasonable way? And, yeah. that, and we've tried to lead on that. And you're absolutely right. All manufacturers, other than a few limited categories, low weight mm -hmm. uh, and amateur built models, and, and maybe some other things, if we argue enough uh, in the NPRM, should be expanded. But the exemptions are going to be small yep. because the security folks have made clear they need to identify virtually everything. Otherwise, they can't figure out which drone is rogue and is posing a threat. Sure. And that leads to, you know, we don't want a world in which drones are being shot down. No, no, day no, no. Because people can't figure out who's flying. Right. So it, it all leads to, to, I think, is a very efficient security response, which is what we all need mm -hmm. in order for the industry to move forward. Totally agree. And I think the example I look to again and again, there's a bunch of them, but the one is the wildfires in California. I can't imagine being a firefighter on the ground, putting my life at risk, trying to put a fire out and the air tanker's coming over and it has to land because some knucklehead's got a drone up over the fire. Having forest service or first responders the ability to see the remote ID, find out where that pilot's standing, to go have a conversation about you shouldn't be flying here because we've got a tanker going up, that's a home run. So for me to give up a little bit of that, a digital license plate's not that big a deal. And I, I still am shocked by the pushback on the remote ID of like, I don't want to identify. If you're flying right and you're flying sane, you've got nothing to worry about. I, I know the community pretty well, mm -hmm. having, having flown recreational for 25 years. Right. Um, so I'm not surprised that yeah, people, I'm not either, especially I'm, people not paying attention for right. a number of years, would, would have an adverse reaction. Mm -hmm. I think the FAA didn't do itself a favor. They rushed coming it. Out, yeah, they fast. didn't rush it. If, well, any, if anything, I, it's a year. I'm late. thinking they dropped it like on New Year's Day and, you know, oh, the 30-day comment it was period. like Boxing Day. It was I know. Day all right. All right. But, but it, it, it was... Um, and the 60-day comment period is a little short for some. That's what I was it's, thinking, it, too. Yeah. yeah. No, what I'm saying is like the... the, 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 the ex extreme nature of the proposal, right? Like, do it both ways. There's virtually no exception to it. Right. Um, uh, the only thing that can fly at an AMA field would be like an amateur built model that you that you fabricate right. most of on your own. Mm -hmm. Like, this is so exceedingly uh, it's burdensome. It's so limited, it is. That, yeah. you know, the negativity is amplified. Correct. Because people who actually do read it are, are seeing it and think it's, it's like, like kind of outrageous. Yeah, it's, it's complete leap yeah. forward. So yeah. there was this, you know, we, we knew we were going to get over, and to some extent, Aeroscope, I, 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 and the demos were... I think it's a wonderful solution because you're protecting the airflights like, and the prisons. Like we, yeah. we wanted to also be, and, and we are, a good partner to the government mm -hmm. in many things, including getting out the idea that, that drone remote ID is important. Mm -hmm. And so when you watch the video that we just put out on drone to phone, we explain why this is important and should be welcome by the industry, knowing that we were going to have an acceptance right. challenge by some in the community. I don't think the FAA did itself a favor by making it so extreme that now it, like people are dug into this being Boy, a horrible reacting. idea. Yeah, they are. They, and you guys are getting yeah. grief for it. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about it. I'm getting grief for right. it. I didn't invent that. I'm not even involved in it. Yeah. I fly as well. But I think if they had start it with maybe a broadcast ID, let that go for a year, see how it goes, and then moved into maybe more deeper involvement with networks. But my, my big question to you, the next is going to be, with this kind of burdensome aspects to it, what do you think compliance is going to be like? I think a lot of people out there are going to say, you know what, I'm flying and I don't care. Come get me, right? And that's a dangerous place. I, I'd I, rather have everybody be compliant. I, hey, I'm, I'm seeing that, and I'm sure you are, yeah. anecdotally on social media, and that, oh, that's that bad news. It bad is, news. yeah. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure we wrote that in the initial blog post that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, this was clear in the ARC report, we need a very high level of compliance. Right. Make it's, it simple, make it transparent, and yeah. compliance will go through the roof, right? Well, if you make it easy and, and free, which right. is what we think broadcast is, um, compliance will be very high because people won't care. Mm -hmm. And that's what's necessary in order to have the security solution. Right. Because if you're, if one of the functions of remote ID is to discriminate between friend and foe, and let's say you've got an environment in which people are incentivized mm -hmm. to skirt the rule, to import non-compliant equipment, right. to build their own, to use older technology yeah. longer because sure. that's how they get around. If that's the environment and let's say 20, 30, 40% of drones are not compliant, there is no remote The whole solution. program falls apart. The whole yeah. thing is, yeah. is useless. Like all right. of that cost is now right. useless because the security agencies can't actually discriminate and they will need to shoot down a large fraction of drones right. in those critical areas. And, the, and, and the, that's the concern. Like, if we don't have an easy way to comply and a cheap or, or free way to comply, remote ID doesn't work. And that drives me nuts because as a flyer, the bad guys are the ones that are ruining it for everybody. So the knuckleheads flying, if they are over airports or the fire or whatever, those guys are getting in the news, then I'm getting grief for flying a drone. I'm flying legit, you're flying legit, we're both flyers. I can't imagine the reasonable flyers not being upset of the guys that aren't registering, right? That's just gonna put us in a bad place. Yeah. Let me talk briefly about the technology, because this is important. A lot of people are, are commenting, hey, I'm gonna buy a new drone, I'm gonna hold off and figure out what's going on. You guys as a manufacturer must be going nuts trying to figure out what it's gonna look like when it settles. Because you have products in the pipeline, I'm sure, that you're developing. Everything's gotta be frozen until we figure out, are they gonna force us to transmit, because that's gonna be a software upgrade. Can I use Wi-Fi, can I use Wi-Fi? So it kind of freezes everything, but if they end up in the broadcast scenario that we're talking about, using Wi-Fi with the drone or phone or some similar application, your drones are ready. And actually, I've tested them. Your drone's going all the way back to the Spark already. So with DJI Go 4, I can go into the application now, put my FAA ID number in there, I can put comments in that I'm flying around a house doing surveying. So you're already broadcasting information, so it's done. All the other manufacturers that are using Wi-Fi should be able to accommodate that technology. So what I'm getting at is, if you're thinking about buying a drone, get out there and buy the drone and start flying, unless they put these draconian measures in place where they've got to do transmit and broadcast on some weird frequency, right? Then so, it's brand new drones. I, first of all, I don't think this proposal should impact purchase decisions yet because right. that, like, it's not final. It's, it's three gonna, years out too. Right? Yeah, right. I, I think it's, we're probably, I, I, there's already 25,000 comments. So like they're gonna need time to right. process that and finalize the rule, especially if they make changes. Mm -hmm. That's a year, year and a half away probably. Okay. Um, and then there's the implementation period of over three years. Okay. So by then there are new products and it kind of doesn't matter. So you should just buy what you want today and not worry about this. Right. Yeah. Now, I, I, I I agree with you, and really it's been our, our goal all along as part of that ease of compliance to have the ability to update the software to, to make the drones compliant sure. when the requirement exists so that people don't have to replace their drones. Right, on that ASTM standard, I guess, that's out there that's being... Yeah. Okay. So the challenge, I mean, there, so number one, that's kind of the vision, mm -hmm. and, and we do believe that as to the broadcast solution, most of our products can do that or, or will be able to do that by the time they need to. Okay. However, the way the FAA has set up the NPRM uh, is a little bit of a, of a challenge with what we're calling retrofit because we have to certify by serial number right. that the drone is compliant, but we're no longer in control of the product that you've already bought from us. Correct. So I'm not actually sure that under this NPRM we can retrofit anything Right. because how would we certify something that we no longer have control That's of? what I'm saying. It's a nightmare for the it, manufacturer. It, it, so, it has to be. I don't know, whatever, however that You'll figure it out, I'm sure. Well, I'm not, I'm not worried about us, right? Okay. Like, I'm worried about the you know, other companies that are part of the drone ecosystem, right? right. The smaller manufacturers, the people that, that I mean, are friendly competitors with mm -hmm. us. Like, like, we welcome innovation wherever sure. it exists. And I, I'm not worried about DJI either having costs here or, or burdens. Like, we're going to figure it out, right, right. once we have to. Um, and hopefully it will involve an update and mm -hmm. not replacement of your equipment. That's sure. our goal. Um, but I don't know that the legal framework will let us do that. Let's see how things turn out. Okay. Um, but I, I think other companies definitely should be concerned about uh, the certification requirements, the, the auditing, the, the site visits, the things in there, uh, the shift in responsibility, the, the need to disable the drone from taking off if it doesn't work, like the, these are draconian yeah. uh, approaches to a regulation that 
we can figure out if we have to, mm -hmm. but are bad for innovation and Correct. bad for the broader. They're going to stifle everything, right? Yeah, and I mean, I'm thinking of like the small FPV drone companies. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I know those that guys, and in, yeah. some of them were clients of mine when I was in private practice. Like, right. like those are not systems that are set up to be internet connected. Right. Uh, they're lightweight, small drones, mm -hmm. but they're highly capable. Sure. Um, it's going to be a problem for them, and I, and I know that as well as the traditional model aircraft. But we, but we have to recognize what is the cause of the concern and problem. Right and therefore the solution. Correct. And that is not based on weight, it's yep. based on the capability. Capability, correct. And that means that yes, like people, including us, who've said, look at the capability, are, are making a distinction in the technology. Yep. But that makes sense, and yeah, we have it does. to be reasonable. Uh, and that's, I don't know if FAA is gonna revisit that or not. Revisiting it is pretty complicated because of course a weight cutoff is so simple. Yeah. Um, who, who knows, but yeah. look, we're, we're always on the side of what's right. In yeah. terms of like a reasonable policy and sensible, right? Sensible yeah. for the public. I get it. And so, we've been open about that. I mean, you can read all right. Going back to March 2017, we talked about remote ID uh, with, with our paper that said, "Do this with a local broadcast. Mm -hmm. That's going to protect privacy." Correct. Because it's a local solution, not a not an all known. I, I, I completely. So we've been understand. saying the same thing for almost three years now. Yep. And I agree with the aeroscope. You can protect a particular facility because you know where the drones are up to 15, 20 miles out, and you can ID them. And people are using the drone to phone application locally in a forest when there's a fire. It gives them everything they need to do. The one challenge I've gotten, I kind of talked before about this, with the drone to phone application, I'm kind of getting a little aside here, is I'm, I'm a little worried that the way the FAA's put it out there already is that the identification will happen for both law enforcement and the public to identify not only the remote ID, which is the license plate, but where that pilot's standing. And I completely understand law enforcement needing to know where the pilot's standing if he's doing something bad. I would hope that when they modify it, that all I get as a consumer is the remote ID. So if they're hovering over my backyard for 25 minutes, I can ID the drone. If I'm really upset, I'll call the police and say, here's the guy's license plate. Yeah, please look into this, right? So we'll see where it all ends. I'm hoping they went too far and they're gonna back off a little bit. One other thing I gotta point out, and this is something a lot of people miss, the FAA is in charge of anything that flies from the grounds to the heavens. They could tomorrow decide, we've had enough of these drones. No more drones flying. They could, <laughs> it'd be crazy, but it could happen, right? So. Anything we can do to help them sort of not do that and be sensible about it, I think is a good thing. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is sort of the commercial interest, because a lot of the people out there are the misguided impression that this is all about Amazon and the big companies wanting to fly drones all over the place and we're annoying because we're in their airspace. I'm sure some of it had to do with that. And as you mentioned before, reading through your ARC report and some of your comments on your website, I think 7% of the people that were part of the constituents that were together for the 74, the group of 74, were really flyers. The rest were commercial interests, law enforcement, people that are gonna run the system that would take that reporting data and profit off that. So there's a lot of capital involved in there. Commercial manufacturers, I think the CDA was in there, CMA was in there. So there's, there's a lot of commercial interest in that discussion. It strikes me as weird that a tiny percentage of the people that had a voice at that meeting were actually included, right? You'd think some other people would be in there to have that conversation on behalf of the flyers. Yes, but uh, the ARC was not set up to, to balance the interests and represent them. It was, it was set up to, I mean, you look at the charter, right? Mm -hmm. Like determine the solutions for remote ID as well as the needs of law enforcement, aviation, right. uh, air traffic. You broke it into three groups like technology, security, yeah, one other like one. The point of that ARC was unlike the prior two ARCs, the fight over people ARC and the registration ARC, which were, mm -hmm. I would say, fairly balanced. This ARC, for reasons I don't know, I didn't, wasn't my choice. Uh, was really focused on who's got a solution to this, put everyone in a room, also who needs, who's there to articulate what they needed from remote ID, mm -hmm. and then who's there with solutions to remote ID. Right. Put them all in the room, and I'll put a lot of them in, in a room. Lock the door. For right. the summer. <laughs> right. Lock the door and see what happens. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and not, by the way, what, what are the, the people paying and, and burdened by remote ID think. Right. That's the opportunity right now in the it is. six days. So say that again. We six days left that, to comment in the FAA. It's the only way you're gonna impact that. Yeah, yeah like that is right now. And and we've put out a, a, a sort of tips to, uh, on commenting. Um, and there are resources. The Alliance for Drone Innovation has a resource. I'll put links down below for all this stuff so yeah. you can get it in part of the clip. But I'm, you've done a great actually, job. Actually, actually I, I gotta say, I, I, I've, it's been great to see engagement across the community, really for the first time, maybe because this is so uh, stark, right? Um, but this is sort of like the, the discussion that's been going on for years. It's mm -hmm. like you know, we've got people in the room on various committees and things, and and the people most impacted by the outcomes are not there or not included. Mm -hmm. And we want, we need them 
to, to be out there. To have that voice. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and that was the, like the last few days of, of being able to do that. Correct. And I'm hoping that it continues beyond that. Now, I've got, um, I've got other clips coming to talk about the people in charge of these committees nationally. So I've got names and numbers, and I'll put a clip up about that, of the people in your state that are on the committees that have an influence over the FAA. So even after the comment period, there's still a lot of discussion behind the scenes where you can get a hold of a senator or congressman and impress upon them how important this is to you as a constituent that votes for them, and they can have an influence on the FAA as well. The last thing I want to say, and this is, it sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a DJ fanboy when I say this kind of stuff, but I love your tech. What I love more about the company beyond the tech, because people build cool tech, is that you guys are taking this on as a company. You're out there in front of it. You're spending your summers in a locked room with a bunch of people arguing about what this thing should look like. It's my job. And, and the company's <laughs> spending money and time and treasure building this. Yeah. There's no commercial benefit in this for you. It's not like you're going to get more money because you're building some cool system to protect it. You're doing it because it's the right thing. And even today, the fact that you're sitting down with me, it says a lot about the company because you could have very well said, we're not commenting on any of that. You've seen our proposals online, but you're willing to talk about it because you're involved in it, you're invested in it. And, and I think that's a great thing for hobbyists. So if anything, they should be applauding you because I work with all the manufacturers. All the other guys are keeping their head down. I, I can't get them to comment. I can't get uh, meetings with them. And so yeah. good on you guys for taking that step. That's a big deal. I, we've been like that for, for, forever. I mean, I, you know, I, as long as I've been in the job, I've been, I'm on Twitter. I tweet a lot. Right. I, I res respond to resp replies I get on Twitter. Yep. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's important. Like we're, we're, we have a community of users and right. care about what they think. And, and, and they're most, passionate. They, they love yeah. the hobby. They love it. And, and most they, of the policy um, outcomes impact them, right? right. Like they're, to some extent, this is about standards and technology finally, and it's not just operational rules and requirements, mm -hmm. but ultimately it is going to be about what the users have to do. Great. And, and so how could we not, why would we not engage and, and, and hear from the community? In fact, I got to say, even though we're getting a lot of heat for the remote ID drone phone demo, mm -hmm. it's been terrific in that we have heard from people about the concerns on pilot location yep. in a way that I don't think we, we or anyone would have heard or been aware of had we not done the video with the demo I agree. or the press release in November that said the same thing. Yep. So in some ways, the demo, as anxiety uh, provoking as it was, <laughs> I didn't mean I didn't bring it up. But it's fine. Yeah. You know, look, uh, I know you're taking a pounding there, it, but it's fine yeah. because yeah. I think it's actually I think it's good. It's because healthy. Yeah. That, that was a demo of what we understand the FA requirement to be. Yeah. And so if there's a problem with it, it's the FA that needs to hear from you, and we have facilitated and encouraged people or, or, or inspired people to comment because we've shown what it would be like yeah. in a way that 300 page, pages of paper would not. Right. And so, yeah, we, maybe we got some heat for that and people hate us. Uh, it's very fashionable ah, it's temporary, to, to yeah. hate DJI. They'll okay, I get it. Yeah. Um, but actually, from my perspective, that's good because now people have seen it in video form, which is the medium of our, of our era, what drone remote ID will be like. And yes, it's anticipated that the pilot location is a feature because that uh, enables a security response. It also enables friendly conversation. Hey, what are you doing flying a drone here? Yeah. That's not a bad thing, mm. but absolutely agree, and, and we've heard it loud and clear, safety uh, risk to the pilots. Right. Um, and we are very sensitive to that. Right, and, and you're going to adhere to whatever the FAA decides. It's to. not like you're going to put an advanced feature in that isn't there. So no. if the FAA says you have to identify that pilot location, it's got to be in the app. It's going to work, right, if that's the final proposal. Uh, we, we will strive to comply with what the legal requirement is. Right. We'll, ha we'll have to. But I know you're still not, yeah. you're commenting as well to try and get it sorted out. Yes. So. And I'm one of those old school guys that think, you know, any problem can be solved over a cup of coffee and a rational conversation. So the fact yeah. that you put it out there and spawn those <laughs> conversations, maybe I'm naive, but it started those conversations now people are keenly aware of what it means, and I'm hoping that drove them to the FAA site to get the comments out there. Good. All right, well, listen, thank you so much. You've been really hey. gracious with your time today. Of course. Very brave for you to sit down and have this conversation. Hope you guys are appreciating how much these guys are putting themselves out there to support this community. So stay tuned. We'll have more clips soon. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again.